you, distinguished senators. My name is Elisha Ongoya. I stand here to make the deputy president's opening statement. Allow me, Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, to open by reminding us some fundamental principles. We are sitting here today as a Senate to discharge a constitutional mandate. And before you are given the cudgels to start discharging any mandate in this Senate, the Constitution demanded that you had to take an oath of office before you do anything else. I now understand better why that oath of office was prescribed and why it was framed the way it was framed. The Deputy President reminds you the following terms in your oath of office before you assumed office to discharge the functions of senators. You have to bear true allegiance, true faith, sorry, and allegiance to the people and the Republic of Kenya. You have to obey, respect, uphold, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of Kenya. And you have to faithfully and conscientiously discharge your duties as members of the Senate. I submit respectfully that the case regarding the proposal to remove the deputy president from office by impeachment may appear to put the deputy president on trial, but that is only in the most technical sense of this process. At a more significant level, what is on trial throughout these proceedings is the resilience and steadfastness of our constitution, our constitutional institutions of checks and balances, and actually their capacity to withstand any form of waves and pressures. That is what is truly on trial. His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa beseeches this house to keep in mind that we have a constitution, a constitutional order, and a constitutional democracy to protect as we conduct these proceedings and as we make decisions in these proceedings. He asks you that at the end of this exercise, let our constitution, our constitutional democracy, and our constitutional order emerge stronger. Allow me to address this House on the defined standard for impeachment of the Deputy President. In a comparable decision by the Supreme Court of Kenya, the case of Honorable Mike Mbuvi Sonko versus the Clark County Assembly of Nairobi and others, the Supreme Court observed as follows, and I quote, it must, however, be stressed for the avoidance of doubt that the power of impeachment, removal, or recall is not one expected to be in constant or frequent exercise. It is only in the face of credible evidence of extraordinary wrongdoing that the conduct of a state officer will be investigated, and even then, only upon sufficient proof of the allegations that the impeachment, removal, or recall would be warranted. Two questions we pose must constantly linger in your minds, distinguished senators, as you undertake the assignment now before you. Question number one, we beseech you to bear in mind the question, is there credible evidence of extraordinary wrongdoing on the part of His Excellency Honorable Regadi Gashagwa before you? Number two, is there sufficient proof of the allegations 
leveled against His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa. Article 150, Clause 1, Paragraph B, sets out the grounds for removal of a deputy president from office by impeachment. These grounds are, number one, gross violation of the Constitution or any other law. We emphasize the drafter's use of the word gross. Serious reasons to believe that the deputy president has committed a crime under national or international law. Again, we emphasize the word serious, then gross misconduct. Samises, conjecture, street rumors cannot pass master. This conduct must be the conduct of the person of the deputy president. It is sufficiently notorious for this court to take judicial notice of when the late Nderitu Gashagwa, whose will is now referred to here, died. You are told to investigate the conduct of His Excellency Regade Gashagwa at a time, or at the time around which his brother, His Excellency Governor Nderitu Gashagwa, as he then was, died. It is sufficiently notorious that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa was not Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya. But that's not enough. You will peruse the motion before you with a view to finding which ground in that motion is sought to be established by these allegations around what may or may not have happened around the time the late Nderitu Gashagwa died, you will find absolutely no ground supported by those allegations. Let me disclose here. It is designed to whip your emotions. It has no other purpose. Looking at your oath of office that I've alluded to, there is no room for your emotions to be whipped as the basis of decision making in any act that you engage into in the discharge of your constitutional mandate and responsibilities. What does our constitution expect of the mover of the motion in proceedings of this nature? Our constitution expects the mover of the motion to make allegations of any or all the grounds set out in Article 150, Clause 1, Paragraph B of the Constitution. And we begin by submitting, it is true that the mover of this motion has written down some allegations in Volume 1 of the documents from the National Assembly. Secondly, the mover of the motion is thereafter expected to supply credible evidence of an extraordinary wrongdoing and sufficient proof of the allegations against the deputy president. Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, we submit that is where the mover of this motion ought to start having problems with this house when he's called upon to account. It is the submission of His Excellency Regadi Gashagwa, that the motion now before you has fallen short of the threshold set by law by multiple miles. When you examine the material before you, you will discover that it will oscillate between the following categories of stages. One, you will have material before you that is just plainly false. Then from falsehood, it will go to the ridiculous ones. And I'll demonstrate that shortly. There will be ridiculous claims here. Then finally, it will end up into embarrassing claims. Allow me, in the few minutes I have, to just do a snip preview of some of these claims eh, so that we have an overview of the case that is before you. At paragraph 
B of the first volume, which is the impeachment motion, you will find an allegation of this nature that His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa has influenced his family members, allies, associates, and proxies to take control of a local corporate society in Madeira, which they are financially hemorrhaging. Number one, no name of any family member is supplied in the allegation or in any of the evidentiary documents before you. No name of any ally is supplied in the motion or in any of the documents before you. No name of any associate is supplied, even a false name, none, is supplied in the motion and in the documents before you. No name of any proxy is supplied in the motion or in any of the documents before you. The name of the alleged circle is not identified. You can imagine, Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, being called to defend yourself on a claim that you have taken over through your associates a circle that we don't know. Told now, come and defend yourself. I began by saying some of these claims are either ridiculous or embarrassing. Secondly, at paragraph 74A, you'll be told that His Excellency has connived with cartels in the tea sector to block the Kenya Tea Development Agency from implementing guaranteed minimum returns that would benefit tea farmers. No statement, no affidavit, no correspondence from any official of the Kenya Tea Development Agency is before you. No complaint to any agency, no complaint to this parliament by any official of the Kenya Tea Development Agency is before you. It's just a claim which the mover of this motion said before the National Assembly, and surprisingly, to those of us who have some residual faith in our institution, he told the National Assembly, just believe my word for what it is. And when we thought that was a joke, we got a joke lifted a notch higher. The National Assembly actually just believed his word for what it is. No evidence. Nothing in the affidavits before you addresses anything about the Kenya Tea Development Agency. Nothing in the five affidavits before you. Let's progress, good people. Paragraph 72 of the motion before you states that His Excellency has persistently undermined, demeaned, and committed insubordination instead of assisting the President. And let's face it, Mr. Speaker, sir, distinguished senators, if you accuse somebody of insubordination, the only person who can complain of being insubordinated is the supervisor. No statement from the President, no affidavit from the President, even no witness summons to the President has been sought here to call him to complain, he has been insubordinated. The Deputy President, when he received this motion, wrote to the Secretary of the Cabinet, requesting to be supplied by any all assignments given to him by the President, and any that he has not delivered. To date, as we stand here, we have not received a response to that letter. And yet we shall be told, just believe the mover of this motion the member of parliament for Kibwezi West constituency, that when he is oscillating between the National Assembly and Kibwezi West to serve his people, he knows better than the supervisor of the deputy president that the deputy president has insubordinated his boss. I began by observing they will move from the false through the ridiculous to the embarrassing and these are the claims before you. At paragraph 64, paragraph A of the impeachment motion, you will be told that His Excellency, the Deputy President, said that he would present a petition for the removal of Justice Esther Maina from the office, which he has not done to date. Mr. Speaker, some of my eyes are normally problematic, so I will not know the time allocation. 15 minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker, sir. The claim is 
that His Excellency publicly said that he would present a petition for the removal of Justice Esther Maina from office, which he has not done to date. That's the complaint. Evidence is before you that there is a pending complaint by His Excellency, the Deputy President, before the Judicial Service Commission. So the move of this motion first has perjured himself in his affidavit by saying that each of these facts are correct when this fact is false by evidence available. You will find that paragraph 34 of the motion before you, it says that His Excellency falsely threatened to file a petition for removal of Justice Esther Maina. How can the Deputy President be accused of falsely threatening when, in fact, he has filed the complaint? Where is the falsehood when there is a pending complaint? That complaint is before you in the Deputy President's documents for your own perusal. I began by saying they'll move from the false through the ridiculous to the embarrassing. At paragraph 78C, you'll be told that His Excellency routinely summons procurement officers in ministries and state institutions and instructs them to direct procurement of goods and services in a specific manner. No officer from any ministry will swear an affidavit claiming to have been summoned to award any procurement for any goods or any services in a particular manner. In fact, what you'll have before you is actually very ridiculous. You will be told that there was a tender for supply of mosquito nets that was cancelled in May 2023. Then a local company that was an agent of the supplier was following for the return of its bid bond in July, two months after the cancellation of the tender. How can you influence a tender that was cancelled two months ago? I told you it will move from the false through the ridiculous to the embarrassing. Now, the more interesting one is at paragraph 78A. You will be told that His Excellency bullied Kenya Medical Supplies Agency officials into awarding a tender for the supply of mosquito nets to Crystal Limited. Good people, Crystal Limited was not even a bidder for that tender. He pressurized people to award it to somebody who is not even a bidder for that tender. I observed it will move from the false through the ridiculous to the embarrassing. Those of us who understand this motion for what it is, understand why these panel beating maneuvers are being tried here. The motion as presented and approved by the National Assembly will remain in our constitutional history as the most embarrassing motion ever approved by a House of Parliament in the Commonwealth. We respectfully sub submit. You'll be told at paragraph 58 that His Excellency is reasonably suspected to be the principal beneficiary of what are called dubious transactions by Lusona Events Limited. You will then go to the allegations on Lusona Events Limited and you want to see those transactions, how are they terminating to the deputy president? You will not come across any connection. They will just say, a director of this company withdrew some money from his own company, the deputy president or director, none of his family members are director, that person withdrew money from his company, bought a motor vehicle in his own name. The mover will say, I'm therefore drawing a reasonable conclusion that the deputy president is the beneficiary of this. Good people, the word reasonable has meaning known to law. I res submit very respectfully that this falls short of the definition of the word reasonable suspicion. I submit it actually gravitates towards unreasonable suspicion. Now let's look at this. You'll be told that His Excellency has acquired 40 acres of land in Kakuret, Kamburaini, in Nyeri. Evidence before you will show that this is land 
that the deputy president, in fact, bought from a current member of the National Assembly. So he knows that member. In 2015, before he even joined state office as a member of parliament, you are told that the purchase of this land in 2015 shows that in the last two years, the deputy president has amassed immense wealth. I, wonder, I began by saying, let's be elementarily decent. Uh, one of the most frustrating things about preparing for such a hopelessly conceptualized, hopelessly crafted, and hopelessly presented case is that you begin doubting yourself because you begin wondering, what am I not seeing? Land bought from a sitting member of the National Assembly in the year 2015 is supposed to be evidence that in the last two years, His Excellency Rigadi Gashagwa has amassed immense wealth from the office of the president to acquire that property. Now, let's look at paragraph 45G. You'll be told that His Excellency has acquired 80 acres of land in Meru County. No land registration number is provided. Not even an affidavit of a neighbor who says, I know yes, this land is my neighbor. Just an allegation by the mover of this motion like that. And the Swahili say, This mover of this motion stood before the National Assembly and said, just believe me for this statement as it is. The first joke. The second joke, the National Assembly actually believed him and approved the motion. You'll be told that paragraph 45H, that His Excellency has acquired a dairy farm in Nyandarwa County. Now, I guess we all have a common understanding of what a dairy farm is. His Excellency has no dairy farm in Nyandarwa County. The move of this motion does not give us any evidence of this dairy farm in Nyandarwa County. You'll be told that His Excellency has used the office of the deputy president to corruptly influence unnecessary and expensive renovation of his official residence in Karen and Mombasa. What will shock you is this, good people. The contract for the renovation of the official residence of the deputy president was signed by the controller of State House. Unless the move of this motion wants to make a claim that the deputy president conspired with the State House to, end, to have this contract executed. Number two, it will be known to all of us as members of parliament that the money for renovation of this official residence was approved by the National Assembly. Is the National Assembly conceding that it approved money for unnecessary expenditure by government? How can the National Assembly approve money for use for renovation of the residence of the Deputy President? Then after that money is used for the intended purpose, the renovation of the, the official residence of the President, now drag the Deputy President for impeachment for the reason of that renovation. I said it will move through the ridiculous to the embarrassing. You will be told that the deputy president has a helicopter landing facility at his land, Ruguru, Kiamariga, 1223 in Madeira. The deputy president simply has no helicopter landing pad on that farm, a small parcel of land with the Napier grass, unless the mover of this motion can now convince us that new technology has emerged that Napier grass is the constructing material for landing pads for aircraft. That's the only way it can make sense. But because it doesn't make sense, good people, you'll agree with me, it moves from the false through the ridiculous to the embarrassing. Now let's deal with it. You'll be told the deputy president has amassed wealth, a wealth portfolio amounting to 5.2 billion shillings. Elementarily, we must then look at the particularization. Tell us which one is what plus which one is what plus which one is what to amount to this 5.2 billion. This figure, the origin, is only known to the mover of this motion. There is nothing on the body of the motion 
There is nothing in the documents attached to the motion. There is nothing in the video clips to be played by the move of this motion that tells us mathematically how he arrived at this figure of 5.2 billion shillings. Then when the charges were read, distinguished senators, you had some 22 companies being read one by one. Thank you. 22 companies. A number of things will surprise you. You'll just find a company listed called Spiritway Limited. Nothing in this motion tells us what wrong has this company done. Nothing in the motion, completely. It just listed there the way it is. Fortis Vis Group Limited. Nothing in this motion tells us what wrong has Fortis Vis Group Limited done. They're just companies whose names have been listed, and we have spent the taxpayers' money this afternoon listening to these companies' names being written with nothing in this motion telling us. So what wrong has Dorcas Regardi Foundation done? What act are you complaining of for that company? What omission are you complaining of in respect of that company? Heartland Supplies Limited, you just find a name of a company there. No wrongdoing is alluded to it. No allegation is made against it. They're just companies thrown there. Distinguished senators, the Romans called their assembly, which was the equivalent of this Senate, the Patres. It was an advisory council. That name was derived from an old Latin word meaning father. Senate derives its name from the Latin word senex, meaning old man. All these words are supposed to address the sagacious, the, 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 the state of wisdom of the Senate. If this Senate lives true to its historical origin as the Patres, if this Senate lives true to its Latin origins as the Senex, the old man, the wise man, it will see through these lies, it will see through this ridiculousness, it will say through these embarrassing statements. If time were to permit, I will take you through other allegations that meet the same test of falsehood, ridiculousness, and embarrassment. Fortunately for us, the rules of procedure permit us to cross-examine the move of this motion and the respective witnesses as a way of bringing forth these lies much more clearly. We shall do that when the time presents itself. At the end of it all, we shall beseech you to do two things. To be true to your oath of office as senators. <clears throat> to be true to your oath of office as senators. To pour through this evidence, to listen keenly to this evidence, to make a decision premised on the evidence as tested here in cross-examination. And if you do that, we have no doubt in our mind, you will reach the same conclusion that what has been presented before you as a most consequential motion, perhaps in our lifetime, is false, is ridiculous, is embarrassing. I rest the governor's opening statement. That is the deputy president council. It's not the governor. <laughs> My apologies, Mr. Speaker. I have been